I'm Sheen Levine. I have no slides. But I did give a talk this morning. And I'll have two posters afterwards. So I hope you can bear with me. And keep your eyes off the screens for the next 15 minutes. I'm here to talk about the future of discrimination. And it's funny that we would speak about discrimination in this day and age. It should have been something of the past. But I'll tell you a little story. Andy Warhol, who's from Pittsburgh, once said, in the future, everybody will be famous for 15 minutes. That's one thing we know for sure about the future. And I had my 15 minutes after giving a similar talk at another collective intelligence conference back in 2014 in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We showed that in markets where people are competing for profits, they tend to make predictable mistakes when they are surrounded by competitors that look like them. And it is in diverse markets where they are surrounded by people who look differently on the surface that they perform better. So diversity is good for you even if you're just out there to make money. So I had my 15 minutes of fame, and I was doing a uh, radio interview for a public station in Washington, DC. It was very nicely made. It was an hour-long interview, and they kept me commenting on various guests that came on the show and talked about diversity. And towards the end of the show came up an interesting question that kept me occupied for the next few years up to the present. Somebody said, if diversity is so good for you, why do we have to spend so much time talking about it and urging people to embrace it? It's good for you. And my quick response was, diversity is good for you in the same way that kale is good for you. Right? But it led to deeper thoughts, and it led to two projects that I want to update you about. This is work in progress, so things may change, but I'll give you some highlights. So I started by talking about the future of discrimination. And I would like to say that discrimination has no future, but I'm afraid that it does. It is surprisingly persistent. In 1957, Gary Becker published an influential book called The Economics of Discrimination. And he said it's easy. Discrimination has no legs. Because if you discriminate, you'll be out of business. In a competitive market, if an employer decides to discriminate, they are simply not hiring the best people. And their competitors are. If they are paying less to women as opposed to men, then women will naturally gravitate towards employers that pay them full salary. So these discriminating employers would eventually be out of business. Now, Becker was concerned about individual talents, but this, his prediction, should be particularly true if, as we think, diversity amplifies individual talents. So it's not only about your individual talent, it's about the fact that the environment you're in allows you to do more because it's a diverse environment. All right? Anita and Tom, has not it? Wonderfully titled paper about that. So all the more power to diversity. Yet, since 1957, many years have passed. It actually became illegal to discriminate on the basis of gender in the United States in 1964. It's also became illegal to discriminate on the basis of race or ethnicity or religion and many other protective statuses. Yet today, 60 years later, we see segregation. You don't see a lot of female firefighters. You don't see a lot of male teachers in elementary schools. When it comes to race, discrimination was replaced by segregation, both in the job market, in the housing market. So discrimination is still there. And the question is, why? And that's what we are trying to answer. So I'll start with gender. There are various theories that look at 
the sources of the gap between men and women, males and females, whether it's in earning or representation. You often hear about the pay gap. You also hear about gap in representation of females on corporate boards. And there's been two solutions. One solution was a moral solution that says this gap is wrong for moral reasons and we'll fix it as we fix other moral problems through legislation. There's been a second stream that said this gap is problematic for utilitarian reasons because if you want to make better decisions, you need diversity. And so it's in your interest to have a diverse workforce. That's the business case for diversity, if you will. But as I said, somehow it does not materialize, at least not in the speed that we would expect it to materialize if it's really good for you. So when it comes to gender, we ask, how do men and women work together? It turns out they don't work together very well. Supported by a, a generous grant from the European Union, we ran a series of experiments in which people, men and women, were asked to contribute to teamwork. And when they asked to contribute to teamwork, we see that they consider the gender of their peers on the team. And they consider the gender in such a way that they increase or decrease their contributions to the team based on that gender. As a result, all female uh, teams receive the highest contributions, followed by all male team. Mixed gender teams receive the lowest contributions. Now, because men tend to contribute less than women, everything else being equal, and this is well known, women on mixed gender teams receive the lowest outcomes. They are the worst off population. So this could be a hint as to why we continue to see segregation. And indeed, segregation would be one solution to this problem. Both men and women are better off when teams are segregated. Both get more work done. But uh, this is not a good solution for many, many other reasons. So we looked for something else. And that something else is taking advantage of a peculiarity in the way men cooperate. So while it is true that men, on average, are less cooperative than women, they are less willing to put in the work, this average hides an important difference. And this is that the male population is, seems to be composed of two types of males. So men are reluctant to contribute anything, but when they do contribute, they contribute a lot. And it's not the same in the female population. So we created a mechanism that allows these highly cooperative male to raise their hand and say, in an honest way, they can't cheat, to say in an honest way, I'm a highly cooperative male. And if we let this male choose the gender of their peers, who do they choose? They choose females. And these mixed gender teams outperform all other combinations of teams. Because these males, that through our mechanism, can honestly identify themselves, are more cooperative, are more reciprocal, and are less likely to exploit their teammates. When it comes to race, we looked at a different question. The American Economic Association recently put out a climate survey. And one of the striking findings there is that racial minorities feel like they are not respected. And as a social scientist, as somebody who studies behavior, I know that this is their perception. But is this perception the result of an attribution process in which somebody gave them a hard time and they attribute it to their status as racial or ethnic minority? Or is it that they're really treated differently because of the way they look, right? 
I meet nasty people all the time. I meet reviewers that give me a hard time. I attribute it to their problematic personality, not to my race or ethnicity or religion or sexual preference. So in a second series of experiments, we introduce participants to a problem. And if they solve this problem, they get a cash prize. The problem comes with a bunch of data. And the data are ambiguous as they are in the real world. We say, you don't have to solve the problem based on your data alone. You can also look around and see how other people solve the same problem. And then you can tell us what your solution is. Now, we set it up such that some people, all are white participants, some of them are matched with two other white participants, and some of them are matched with two other black participants. Now, if the impression of the minorities is true, then white people should discount the advice of black people, even when it is in their interest to take this advice. And that's exactly what we find. White people are 50% more likely 50% more likely to take the advice of other white people as opposed to black people. That's depressing, and I wouldn't want to leave you with that note. So we thought about ways of combating this. Now, if this is driven by animosity, if this is driven by hatred, then it wouldn't respond to additional information. But we find that it does. We find that when the white participants receive information up front about the skills of their peers, whether white or black, discrimination disappears. Alternatively, we find that if those white participants get the chance to repeatedly solve problems with their peers, either white or black, the discrimination disappears. So both studies say that diversity alone is not enough. Just having a diverse crowd, just having a bunch of men and women in the room, just allowing African Americans into the company is not enough. In addition to diversity, we need informed inclusion. And I'm happy to talk more about it. Thank you. So I'd like to invite our speakers up front so that we can um, take some questions. Um, and I'll use my, um, yeah, you want to here, I'm going to get your microphone. Um, I'll use um, my position up front to start with a question, which is, um, you know, just thinking about the implications across the talks. So we're talking about algorithms, changing organizations, changing roles, um, changing work. What do we think that is going to do? for discrimination and diversity in organizations or and or what should we be trying to do to steer that in a direction if the natural forces are not going to steer it in one that we think is positive? I don't know who wants to start. So one of the strong pushbacks that we've seen to uh, AI is the realization that because AI relies, attempts to mimic human decisions, discrimination is built into those decisions. So rather than AI solving these problems, AI seems to be amplifying the biases that are already inherent in human behavior. So we cannot simply assume that uh, observing people's decisions would put us on a path to making better decisions. We can make more decisions, as Melissa has presented, or quicker decisions, but not necessarily better decisions. I don't, I don't feel like I have a good answer to this. I'll just tell you a story of something that super bums me out. Is that okay? <clears throat> um, so I teach a class that I call the future of work, and um, I was trying to make the division of labor and society really salient for people. So I um, wanted, sorry, walking up was like, Put me out of breath. Um, anyways, I, um, so I gave them, I, I just like fully made this up. So I'm not a historian. I just made this up because I thought it would be like a clever exercise. So I got um, a description of the division of labor in the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, 1900s, 2000s. And I was just like, won't it be like interesting for us to like look at the division of labor in society across hundreds of years? And in the 1600s, I don't know if you remember this, um, people 
were technology. I mean, they're not, they're not, they were not, they were slaves. And um, like people were used to create wealth for other people in this really super problematic way. And then a hundred years later, I can't remember what it was, something else happened. And then like, so it was like, then railroads came and then like the industrial revolution and then something else. And I was like watching what had happened to like the community that was brought over as property. They were not, but they were treated like that, right? Um, and like every hundred years, there was this like huge like technical transformation. And I was like, they didn't have a chance to catch up. That's like not fair that it kept happening. Like all of these like new technologies coming along when that was like the basis of where we started from. Um, so I'm watching like AI in San Francisco right now and I'm like watching like how ridiculously homogenous is what I'm gonna call it, San Francisco is right now. And I'm like, that has roots in like, for like, so that bums me out is what I wanted to say. I don't have a solution, <laughs> help. Yeah, I guess I might just add a little bit um, kind of from a similar perspective, I guess, of, of just being inside of uh, an organization for a long time that, uh, uh, you know, that was in San Francisco where, um, you know, all these folks who are really stoked to be creating new stuff and um, making lots of change and, um, uh, you know, experimenting with software. Uh, and that had a lot to gain were exactly who you would expect. These were like, you know, I think 20 people in this office and 18 of them were white men, I think. Um, which is like, I mean, it boggles the mind. Um, and when you think about the massive amount of value that's being created for investors, and the company I studied ended up becoming a unicorn, you know, a valuation over a billion dollars, um, lots and lots of early employees were cashing out and um, obviously early investors cashing out as well. They're just generating these massive, massive amounts of value um, that's all just being funneled to this very, very small uh, group of people uh, who are either investors or early employees in this office. Whereas you have these armies of workers in the Philippines, um, in Las Vegas, who I talked about, and later in Salt Lake City, um, who are uh, you know, doing much of the crucial yet mostly behind the scenes work that's going on to generate all this value. Um, and uh, you know, these millions and millions of dollars obviously are, are filtering down into a very specific sub-sub population of, of contributors here. So also sad, help. Yeah. <laughs> so anybody have something happier to say or any questions from the audience? Hi, uh, I'm actually surprised that I, nobody else raised their hands yet. But um, so this kind of relates to this, but it goes more directly towards what Melissa was presenting, which is uh, so you gave an example of a part of the company, a very small part of the company, solving a local uh, optimization problem, and of course you give it a local problem, it's going to solve that local problem, and then as you 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 up level the you expand the 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 the, the problem space it's gonna you, you're gonna be uh well anyway the, the the point that i'm making is uh like uh, mary said in her talk uh organizations were built to to solve uh factory for floor problems right we're still living in that in that model and uh and we're still trying to figure out how to get our organ organizations to solve more complex more uh uh, multi-dimensional, more uh, unpredictable, and uh, wicked problems in environments that are constantly changing. So, I would my my piece of optimism here is that it, a lot of it has to do with we still haven't really developed the the, the thinking tools necessary to to solve these problems. That's kind of my my argument there, which goes back to what Tom says about we need to create the structure for collaboration that are going to eventually solve these problems. That's a cool idea. I think that totally resonates, yeah. yeah. And I like that you mentioned wiki tools because I, I want to slightly qualify the comments that I made earlier. One of the promises of technology is that it enables this faceless cooperation. So I know that uh, marketplaces have been receiving a lashing here this uh, lunchtime. But uh, when I hire people on these platforms, I don't know 
who they are. I don't need to know their gender. I would not even like to know or sort by geography, because why should I care if you're from the Philippines or from Russia, as long as you can get the job done? So that's a promise in technology. Prom technology, for better or worse, allows us to move away from face-to-face -face interactions to working with people that are located at a completely different place geographically. And we can piggyback on that and say, we can strip away all potential discriminatory characteristics from these people. This could be a problem, as I think we all recognize. But it could also be a promise, especially for populations that are typically discriminated against. Can I try again to say something back to you? Just, um, just an interesting thing that I'm recalling from my field site is there was a moment in the marketing department where they had a decision tree for how they like targeted customers. So it was just like a static decision tree. And then they changed to a multi-arm bandit. Yeah. And like it was like, um, like really dynamic. So like the visualization, I was like, hey, that's like an org chart. And hey, that's like a very dynamic thing. So I think that's what you're talking about, right? Like the tools and the artifacts for organizing us are going to be very like much more dynamic and interesting, which totally like cues up Ben's point about who's going to be like, whose jobs are going to become much more volatile and whose jobs are going to, anyway. So yeah, I think it's a good point. Hello. Thank you very much for your comments. Um, I'm doing a bit of research on algorithmic fairness. So um, I felt like there were a few things that I must comment on. <laughs> um, I don't know how comfortable I feel with the idea of saying um, people of category X are this way, regardless of whether that this way is charged with positive or negative balance. So even when I hear like, oh, women are better collaborators, Okay, yes, maybe they are socialized to be better collaborators, but actually there's a um, tremendous body of work in the field of statistical study of fairness that talk about how even if you introduce some kind of fairness constraints, there's always some certain boundary you can never do better than. And really the only way to be intelligent about the decisions that we make about who we hire, who we promote, and so on, I think require an understanding of the causal graph of why is it that base rates of something of interest are different across populations? So it's not enough to just say, oh, women are better collaborators. No, why are they? Maybe because guys don't pass the ball. Maybe, maybe because all of these historical things. Maybe like you have this node that is between race and outcomes that is called racism. And you really cannot kind of deconstruct this back to some, something that will explain this away. So um, I feel like a little bit more nuance is maybe something that um, we should hope to achieve in the uh, collaborative, collective intelligence community. I agree, thank you. One last question. Hi, I'm Dean. I'm from the University of the West Indies. I am a researcher with interest in collective intelligence as well as in natural language processing. Now, NLP is driven a lot by artificial intelligence these days. There are linguistic influences to that as well. But one of the more recent focuses on the um, concerns of the NLP community really comes down to fairness as well, which has been mentioned. And what has been found is that the AI approaches that are, that are being used are intrinsically biased because the data that it's based on, that it's learning from, also has implicit biases in there. So there are different ways, there are different approaches to solving that type of problem. But a lot of it comes down to how we generate that data. The data is generated by some sort of collective generally. And I just wish to make this comment so that we are aware of it, so that when we develop CI systems that will produce this data that will later drive AI systems, that we consider that as well, consider the, um, the biases that we might be capturing, whether implicit or explicit. Thank you. I think that's a great point. 
Well, please join me in thanking the, the panelists for some very thought-stimulating uh, conversations. Okay, so now we're going to shift more into uh, reception and socializing mode. Um, so on the other side of this divider are, uh, gonna be, is going to be our poster session. And gradually, as you are um, fed mentally by the posters, food will start to appear and, and some beverages to feed you physically as well. And so we'll have a, a poster session in the reception next door. And then right around 6 o'clock, and next Actually, I think we're going to be opening this wall. You'll kind of filter back over into here. Um, and that is where the name of the bridge that is on the back of your name tag will come into play. Uh, we're going to ask you to sit at the table that corresponds to the bridge that you have been assigned. And then you will receive further instructions. So please enjoy the posters, reception, and we'll see you at 6.